Hello and welcome um, to one of our JEDI AAEM MS4 lecture series. Um, in this lecture, we'll be talking about toxicology today. Um, I am Jordan Vaughn. I am a current um, fourth year in chief at LSU in New Orleans. Um, here's my contact information. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, and I look forward to teaching you a little bit about toxicology today. First, I would just like to kind of talk about why um, I love emergency medicine and why I went into emergency medicine as a specialty. Um, I was exposed early. Um, I knew kind of in the back of my mind, it was always something that I wanted to do. Um, but as I had different experiences with shadowing and especially through medical school, school, it just became apparent that, you know, emergency medicine physicians are on the front line. You know, they truly have that pulse on the community and what the community needs are. So I knew that through working in the emergency department, I would continue to be able to, you know, create programs and work with the patients that um, needed us the most, and which was the main reason of why I went into emergency medicine. So that's a little bit about me. Um, as far as objectives for this lecture, um, I hope that after this lecture, you'll be able to conduct a thorough, you know, medical history as well as toxicology physical exam. Um, hopefully, you'll also be able to learn a little bit um, about the basic toxidromes and their treatments, um, and we'll go over a little bit of a couple of cases towards the end. Um, and then finally, um, we'll touch a little bit on the bias um, and stigmas that um, urine drug screens can have on patients in the emergency department as well. So um, the basics of the toxicology encountering exam. The biggest thing is going to be history, okay? Toxicology is all about kind of putting the different um, pieces of the puzzle together, if you will. Um, medical history is huge. Um, and, you know, at the bottom, paramedics and family history, the collateral that you get from that is so important. Um, you know, a lot of times EMS will bring in a patient, but they were in the patient's home and they can say, you know, what the situation of the um, surrounding area that the patient was picked up from, you know, were they around family, were they able to get collateral from that family, um, a lot of times calling the family in the chart um, and getting that number in the chart and kind of calling them for collateral can be very helpful as well. If the patient is alert and talking to you, of course, the patient is going to be the biggest thing to kind of help you get that history to put the pieces of the puzzle together, okay? So, asking about different medications, but not just what they're taking, not their medical problems, but also what other medications are in the home, okay? Um, really making sure to pay attention to kind of like what they have access to, okay? Big thing is um, a history of psych, all right? That can kind of let you know what medications that they may have access to as well. Do they have a history of drug use? Um, do they have any prior suicidal like ideation or a history of prior attempts in the past? Um, all these things are very helpful. Um, and lastly, social history or acute stressors, okay? Um, you know, did they just recently lose a job? Um, have they recently just separated from their partner? Um, you know, have they recently just lost a loved one? All these things can kind of help um, do a risk assessment for patients, okay, in toxicology as well. And the basics of the toxicology encounter and exam, the biggest thing is gonna be your ABCs, okay? So it's always airway, breathing, circulation, making sure that you resuscitate and stabilize that patient. Vitals, 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 okay? Um, are extremely important in taking care of our patient. What is their general appearance in looking in that physical exam? Are they diaphoretic? Is their skin flushed? Are they dry? Um, what's their GCS? Is that patient alert? Are they somnolent? You know, are they up and alert talking to you? Or are they up but confused? Um, doing that HENT exam, okay, so looking at the patient's pupils, are they equal reactive? Um, are they constricted? Are they dilated? You know, looking at their respiratory drive, are they tachycardic? You know, are they bradycardic? Um, all these things, including even bowel sounds, are important in assessing the patient, um, and the big one being skin, which we forget about the most, but it is very important, and you'll see this a little bit later. As far as the basics um, of the toxicology encounter, the next thing being labs after you do your physical exam, um, the biggest thing, as always, that we talk about is just the drug panel and what's included in that, okay? So, you want to make sure that you're getting kind of like the bit back things that can be the most harmful to the patient. So that's going to be your volatiles. Okay. Um, and in that included, you also want to include a blood osmolality as well. The salicylates, Tylenol level, getting a gas to make sure that the patient, you know, isn't super alkalotic or acidotic. 
um, but also getting a drug screen, okay? The one thing that I wanna make sure to talk about in regards to the drug screen is the drug screen does not always pick up everything, okay? Um, it can be sensitive for a lot of drugs, but there are a lot of things um, that the drug screen unfortunately cannot pick up. So just because the drug screen is negative does not mean um, that the patient may not have something in their system that's contributing to you know, their clinical picture, okay? Um, drug screens also are very variant um, depending on their assay from one hospital to another. So it's important to know, you know, what specifically can the drug assay at this institution, you know, pick up and what can I expect um, that it will be screening for. Another thing in getting labs is just your basic chem panel, okay? You want to check out their renal function. Um, you want to check out your liver. So doing a CMP is all um, and just getting that basic CBC as well. EKG, 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 super important. You also want to make sure that um, you're checking the patient's rate, intervals, checking for any arrhythmias, okay? So I do want to take a little bit of time to kind of talk about the bias with drug screens in the emergency department. Um, one of my favorite faculty at my institution um, is a trained toxicologist. Um, and during my intern year, he asked me, what is it? if at all, um, what this drug screen do for you when you order it? Is it gonna change your management? Um, and I find that 99% of the time um, when I'm practicing that it does not change my management. Um, this study here, um, do you really need that emergency drug screen um, was a great um, literary review um, that reviewed adult as well as pediatric cases and those that um, drug screens were ordered to determine whether or not it changed a provider's management at all. Um, and in a large, overwhelming majority, it did not. Um, and in fact, we know that drug screens often actually kind of introduce bias into a patient's chart. Um, a lot of times you're kind of flagging that person, um, and then one person may kind of put, this is a 20-year-old male um, with a past medical history of X, Y, and Z drug use. And that follows that patient, it's copy and paste it forever, and it continues to follow that patient um, through. And that in itself can just introduce many biases um, from one provider to the next as they care for our patients, not just in the emergency department, but through to inpatient and you know whatever service it is that they're seeing them. So this is a great chart. Um, I found it very helpful. The biggest thing with toxicology you'll hear is that it's a lot of memorization, and it is. Um, but it's a lot of memorization and kind of picking up on different trends, okay? Um, and so with different toxidromes, you'll see here the anticholinergic, cholinergic, sympo sympathomimetic, opioid, as well as um, sedative, okay? So in all of these, the biggest things are gonna be vitals. So heart rate, BP, you know, your respiratory rate, as well as temperature. But then it's also gonna be physical exam, okay? So a patient's pupils, their bowel sounds and skin are gonna be very telling in the difference between all of these toxidromes. Um, throughout all the toxidromes too, it's important to kind of try to key in the ones that are like very similar, maybe what that one thing is, it may be the difference between them, okay? Um, so if you notice cholinergic, um, and your go fast toxidromes are going to have increased bowel sounds, um, whereas your anticholinergic may have a lot of those same things of like an increased heart rate um, or increased respiratory rate and temp, but may have decreased bowel sounds. Um, so that, as well as paying attention to the skin, if the patient's wet, diaphoretic, versus if they have like really red, dry skin, could also be the difference in telling the difference between these toxidromes. So this is a great place to start as far as trying to kind of classify them and put them um, and organize them as you're learning them. So let's start by learning some cases um, to kind of help us put these toxidromes um, and apply them a little bit, okay? So in case one, um, we have a 30-year-old male presenting to the ED brought in by EMS for agitation. The patient was found wandering around by a college roommate um, and not making any sense. On arrival, the patient's vitals are heart rate of 124, respiratory rate of 22, and they're citing 100% on room air. The patient is hypertensive to 142 over 23, and they are febrile at 38.2 degrees Celsius. The patient is disoriented on questions and appears very agitated. The roommate denied any known psychiatric history. The patient appears to be responding to stimuli while in the room with dry skin, people's five millimeters and reactive, decreased bowel sounds and dry mucous membranes with suprapubic tenderness. Otherwise, exam is within normal limits. What toxidrome are you concerned about here?
Okay, so if you answered anticholinergic syndrome, you are correct. So with anticholinergic syndrome, um, you'll hear the term mad as a hatter, red as a bee, dry as a bone, blind as a bat. Um, hot as a hair and full as a flask. Um, so a lot of times you will have um, urinary retention. You'll have patients coming in very confused, agitated with that dry, red, flushed skin, um, and as well as visual changes. All right. So with the pathophysiology, a lot of times this is due to the inhibition of the muscarinic cholinergic receptors. Okay. And the one that traditionally you'll see this a lot in is Benadryl. All right. Different sleep aids and TCAs can cause this too. Coat preparations are a big deal as well um, because a lot of times you'll have different over-the-counter meds that will have antihistamines in them and people are just taking so many things just to try to feel better and get relief but they're not realizing that they're, you know, kind of introducing a pharmacy and kind of overdosing, right, on antihistamines. So this can definitely happen a lot. Um, as far as treatment, just like any toxidrome, it's just removing the inciting agent, okay? And then it's largely supportive care. So hydrating these patients, cooling them if they are febrile, sedation, um, and always going back to the ABCs of intubating if need be to protect their airway. You got an EKG. So on these patients, just making sure that you're checking for arrhythmias, making sure that their QTC is within normal limits, okay? And that's really important in anticholinergic syndrome as well. So case two, um, we have a four-year-old boy presenting to the emergency department brought in by mother and uncle with vomiting, rhinorrhea, and diarrhea. The mother states he has been at work with her today due to his usual child care provider being sick and unable to take care of him. Um, the mother works as a farm manager. Um, she is currently asymptomatic, asymptomatic herself, but noted that he was playing in a side field while she worked. On arrival, the patient's vitals are a respiratory rate of 144, I'm sorry, heart rate of 144, respiratory rate of 22, oxygen 98% on room air, blood pressure is 110 over 23, and the child is currently afebrile at 36.2 degrees Celsius. What treatment is indicated? All right, perfect. So if you order atropine, that is correct. So this was kind of a two-part question. The first would, um, bring in the question of cholinergic syndrome, and that is exactly what this patient had. Um, and then for you to know kind of which one is best to start first, okay? So in cholinergic syndrome, that's essentially inhibiting that aceno, acetylcholinesterase, okay? Um, which just causes the increase of acetylcholine to build up. And that's kind of just thinking about like if you're sympathetic or your parasympathetics, okay? So you're gonna get that salivation, you're getting that lacrimation, you're getting urination, defecation, literally everything that can ooze will ooze in cholinergic syndrome. That's kind of how I think about it when it helps me. Um, Atropine is the first thing that's given because essentially it's just going to dry that patient up. Okay, so it's going to bind to those muscarinic receptors and it's going to temporarily balk them. All right. Um, and that's going to help that patient like salivate less um, and, you know, stop the lacrimation and urination. Okay, and all the GI cramping and emesis. This is very helpful because obviously, if these things, you know, are left unchecked, you know, the patient's airway can become compromised. So this is something that's definitely important and which you're going to want to start first whenever you're concerned about cholinergic syndrome. Okay. So we have two more cases. Um, case three, a 24-year-old male presents to the emergency department with agitation brought in by EMS. He required bursted in the field for agitation. The patient won't answer any questions, appears agitated, is not responding to any stimuli. Peepers are noted to be five millimeters, equal and reactive by EMS. No trauma noted in the field. On arrival, the vitals are respiratory rate of 26, heart rate of 138, oxygen sat of 98% on room air, and a blood pressure of 174 over 80. Patient is febrile at 38.2. He has dilated pupils, is diaphoretic, bowel sounds are active. The patient is grasping at his chest and shouting, I shouldn't have taken that. <laughs> the patient is moving all four extremities when placed in the room. He does not respond to any verbal de-escalation is not cooperative for any of the interview. Which medication should be administered first? All right, so add it in. And this is our go fast toxidrome. Okay. So, this go fast toxidrome is just essentially a circulating or increased circulating level of um, catecholamines. Okay. So, a lot of the drugs that can call this are 
frequently, you know, as like amphetamines, bath salts, cocaine, MDMA, okay, ketamine. Um, the clinical fe features of this go fast toxidrome are going to be tachycardia. The patient's heart rate is going to be high. Uh, they may also come on and be very agitated. They even may just come in and present just simply as seizures, okay? They're going to have dilated pupils, all right? Everything's just kind of in hyperdrive, including their temperature. The biggest thing is supportive treatment, okay? The big thing and overarching theme of tox is supportive care. Um, the biggest thing is going to be IV fluids. You're going to cool the patient if they're warm, um, but benzos, and you're going to essentially be giving those until you can kind of titrate to the patient's physical exam and either their vitals or their physical exam and their agitation. Okay. All right. Last case. So we have a patient, um, they're placed in your acute resuscitation bed. The nurse shouts for your help. She announces that they were dropped off and that we have no history on the patient, but that they are unresponsive. While they are placing the patient on the monitor, you see approximately a 30-year-old male on the stretcher with decreased shallow breaths. The patient's diaphoretic currently with pinpoint pupils. What is it that you're going to ask for your nurses to pull up next? All right, so Narcan. Um, this toxidrome is our opioid toxidrome, okay? So the physiology of this, we have different um, opioid or CNS suppression uh, receptors, our mu, kappa, and sigma, okay? Um, our drug psychologies are natural as well as synthetic opiates, okay? So your, you know, heroin, your methadone, and even morphine and things that we prescribe in the emergency department and hospital just in general are things that can cause this toxidrome, okay? The biggest thing and key finding, all right, is gonna be a decreased respiratory drive, all right? So a lot of times these patients will be apneic or will have shallow respiratory breaths, breathing maybe anywhere from like three to nine um, times a minute, okay? So very concerning. They might even have bradycardia. Um, they will likely be hypoxic, okay? They're gonna have very pinpoint pupils and that's very key for this exam as well. And the treatment, you guessed it, supportive care, right? But you're going to be giving them Narcan, okay, to reverse. A lot of times you're going to be doing small doses because you don't want to put that patient in withdrawal, okay? But the important thing um, to note is that if you keep giving repeat doses, all right, and the patient is not stabilizing, that you may need to consider a Narcan drip as well. All right, so this is a summary, okay? Um, I find this chart very helpful, um, just to kind of use and save to kind of put in your back pocket as you're studying the different toxidromes. Um, and again, you're looking at the basics, your heart rate, your respiratory rate, your temperature, okay? Um, the pupils, the bowel sounds, as well as the skin exam, okay, are gonna be very telling um, for different patients that come in with different toxidromes, okay? And kind of helping you kind of put them into different boxes and kind of look and see those trends um, that you'll see in between the different toxidromes and which, you know, thing, whether it's the skin and that patient being diaphoretic or having, you know, flushed pale dry skin um, that will kind of like help you discern one toxidrome between the other, okay? Here's my information. Here's my email. Um, feel free to follow me on Twitter. Please reach out if you have any questions about, um, you know, applying an emergency medicine and away rotations. Here are my resources and my references that I used that I found helpful when making this lecture that you guys can hopefully use as well in your studying. Um, and then additional resources in line that are great resources. So Life in the Fast Lane, MRAP, Wiki and are great resources that I used on shift that I found helpful to kind of review these things um, on shift. And this is just our plug to please join. Um, AM has been an amazing organization for me. I started in RSA um, and I've had the pleasure to be active with JEDI. Um, so it's a great organization, great ways to be involved and work with different projects and people in the community that have the same interests as you. Um, I definitely encourage you to become a member if you are already not, okay? Um, I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I hope it gave you a starting point and kind of like a basic approach to toxicology. Um, and that is something that you can kind of apply to your shifts. All right. I hope everyone has a great rotation um, and learning and that um, you have a great journey to emergency medicine. Thanks.